Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here on Sunday morning. Diabetic autonomic neuropathy affects practically every organ, from pupil to penis and from forehead to toe. So if you know diabetic autonomic neuropathy, it is said that you know the medicine completely. Coming to what is cardiac autonomic neuropathy. The autonomic neuropathies are a collection of syndromes and disease affecting the autonomic neurons. The CAN, which I'll uh, call cardiac autonomic neuropathy now onwards in this presentation, the CAN is defined as the impairment of autonomic control of cardiovascular system in the setting of diabetes after exclusion of other causes. So it's a difficult diagnosis. Why should we screen CAN? That's a very important topic. Number one, because CAN is not as uncommon as most of the physicians and diabetologists think. The incidence is practically 2 to 90% across disease. Although it is declining in type 1 DM, but it is rising very fast in type 2 DM. And most of the studies have suggested an incidence of 23%, uh, sorry, a prevalence of 23% in type 1 and 34% in type 2. Number two, CAN is preventable. The DCCT study demonstrated that intensive therapy, even on those years, reduced the incidence of CAN by 53%. Not only that, EDIC study came out with these surprising findings. And what were they? They found out that uh, CAN has also a legacy effect, just as good as diabetes. So if a person's cardiac autonomy, a uh, person's glycemic control is very fine and very well intensively controlled within first five years, the incidence of CAN goes down in later years, even though glycemic control is not good. So it has got a legacy effect. 
although these effects have, were not shown properly in type 2 diabetes, they have now been shown. So why should we screen CAN? Because it is best prevented and it has got a legacy effect. Very important, CAN follows a fixed course. Just as we all know, neuropathy always starts in longer nerves. And that's why lower limbs are first affected than the upper limbs. Same way, the longer nerves are first affected in autonomic nervous system and that's why vagus is the first that is affected. Same way, if you look at the heart, the first area that is affected, sympathetic portion that is affected, so then starts at the apex of the heart and progresses to the base. And so most of the uh, manifestations would start from the base and would go to the, uh, uh, would start from the apex and would go to the base. So CAN follows a very, very fixed course. Another important thing, CAN starts early, although present late. Why does it present late? Because we fail to diagnose early. Otherwise, it starts early. As early as, even before neuropathy starts, CAN can be present. Not only that, CAN can be present even in metabolic syndrome. Lots of studies have now come out, which suggest that CAN is present even in IGT states. And if you pick up CAN at that stage, you can prevent lots of complications that a person is going to face in his life. So CAN starts very early. CAN can be easily diagnosed. We all know, although we don't uh, pursue, just like Duryodhan, we know our religion, but we don't follow it. Same way, we know CAN can be easily diagnosed by bedside methods, although there are different other methods like statistical methods, spectral analysis, imaging technique, baroreflex sensitivity, and microneurography. However, there are five easy techniques by which CAN can be diagnosed. We all know them very well. And the best one is heart rate variability in response to deep breathing, which has got a sensitivity of as much as 80% and a specificity of 85%. Non-invasive, easy to do, requires only a ECG and a bedside uh, BP instrument. Apart from them, we have got uh, two other tests for parasympathetic uh, uh, notion and uh, two tests for sympathetic involvement. And these are the findings or these are the results that would decide the involvement of the systems. That is Valsalva, HRV with deep breathing, heart rate uh, uh, changes in response to standing, BP fall on standing and BP fall on hand grip. So CAN can be easily diagnosed. For routine clinical use, one should record heart rate for one minute on ECG with patient sitting and breathing deeply at six breaths per minute. Measure difference between minimum and maximum heart rate. And that can be done even by a ECG graph. You don't need high-tech machines. This was first time told in 1978 by Ewing until then. So after 47 years, it holds true. Lots of papers have come out after that. And recently, Toronto Consensus Panel on Diabetic Neuropathy concluded that yes, bedside monitoring of CAN is the most uh, sensitive, specific, reproducible and standardized test. Same way, orthostatic hypotension can be easily diagnosed by fall of more than 30 mm mercury in systolic or 10 mm of mercury in diastolic. Although this figure varies with different institutions, but 30 mm in systolic blood pressure reduction has been accepted world over. CAN can be easily treated. If you look at the treatment of CAN, most of them are non-pharmacological measures to which I am not going at present. But it can be very easily treated and very few steps are to be taken which a person can take at home very easily. Few of them, encouraging water consumption, lower extremity stockings, avoiding sudden changes in body posture to sit at the side of the bed, avoid straining and raising your arms above the head and stay away from isometric exercises, avoid medications that aggravate hypotension, eating small frequent meals, several physical counter maneuvers, for example, leg crossing, squatting. So these are all very simple measures that can be taken to avoid the effects of CAN. CAN can only also be treated with pharmaceutical agents. Few of them are, have been shown here. CAN can probably be reversed. Recent findings suggest that CAN can also be reversed, especially with bisoprolol and quinapril. Lots of trial now coming out that can, can be reversed just as atherosclerosis can be reversed. So, we have got now seven reasons why we should screen for the can. But we have got three important reasons why we don't screen for it, although we know for it. Number one is, 
Clinical symptoms are less, signs are many. Most of the patients do not have clinical symptoms. Even a patient falling down, getting fracture because of orthostatic hypotension is going to complain about fracture and not about his orthostatic hypotension. So unless we go and try to search for it, we are never going to get it. So clinical symptoms are less and signs are many. Same way, there are variety of diagnostic tests and the newer tests that have come out that are all research tool at present. But there are so many newer tests have come out and they have really confused the whole matter. Not only that, they have decided that there are seven different tests which should be ideally performed. And depending upon those tests, more than three abnormalities if out of those seven tests are there, then it gives 100% specificity. Now to confuse the matter again, a variety of factors affect the bedside test, including even caffeine can affect the bedside test. Not only that, the cardiac autonomic testing utilizing the heart rate variability by Ewing's method is sensitive, non-invasive. However, it does not match with the recent research tools. Among patients with no evidence of 10 on cardiovascular reflex testing, Abnormalities in cardiac innervation have been found in 40 to 71 percent of patients. So bedside tests probably are not 100 percent sure and can have a complex pathophysiology. So these are probably the reasons, but the most important reason probably is we are not aware about it and we are not ready to open our minds. How do we screen for tests, uh, Ken? Screening should include a history, physical examination and test of heart rate variability, including the basically deep breathing exercise. When do we screen for Ken? Recommendations are very clear at the time of diagnosis in type 2 diabetes and five years after the onset of diabetes in type 1 diabetics and every yearly till it is negative. Now come to the most important and clinical aspect, clinical implications of cardiac autonomic neuropathy. A high risk of cardiac arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. Ken is probably the strongest predictor for mortality during seven year follow up in Eurodiab study. A combined abnormality in heart rate variability and QT index was a strong predictor of mortality. What does it indicate? Importantly, we go on talking about ACCORD study and we give lots of significance to hypoglycemia. But look at ACCORD study. The presence of CAN in ACCORD study strongly predicts all cause and CVD mortality independent of baseline cardiovascular disease, diabetes duration, multiple traditional CVD risk and medication. This aspect of ACCORD study has never been highlighted. So ACCORD study highlighted that CAN is an independent risk factor. What does it mean? You can see that those who having CAN, 30% sudden cardiac death versus those who did not have CAN, 13% mortality. What does it mean? If you try to search for CAN and those who are having CAN, especially type 1 diabetics, you should predict high mortality in them and you should be ready for an unfavorable prognosis. Second thing, silent MI. Ken is associated with silent MI. So those patients of having cardiac autonomic neuropathy, they all must be investigated with stress test, either a treadmill test or a, a pharmacological uh, stress test to find out whether they are having silent myocardial ischemia. You can see those having Ken, 28% silent myocardial ischemia versus those who did not have Ken, only 10%. So those people who are having Ken have higher incidences of uh, silent myocardial ischemia and therefore it's a better predictor of major cardiac events. What does it mean? It means that in patients having diabetes, presence of symptoms such as acute onset of dyspnea, with or without coughing, severe fatigue and or acute onset of nausea and vomiting even should raise higher index of suspicion for an ischemic event when the patient is already having CAN. This is very important because those patients having CAN, as you already know, Vegas is involved, they won't have other symptoms. The heart would not scream, angina would not be there. So even simple, simple symptoms should guide you to the fact that he could have silent myocardial ischemia even with a resting ECG. Intraoperative and perioperative cardiovascular instability. Those patients having CAN, when they undergo surgery, especially under spinal anesthesia, they require excessive amount of vasopressors. So most of the anesthetists fail to understand why the patient developed sudden hypotension despite the same dose of vasoconstrictor agent given. But the reason is patient probably had cardiovas or, uh, cardiovascular autonomic uh, neuropathy and that's why uh, he or she developed 
uh, hypotension which required additional vasopressor agents. So if you know that the patient has Ken, you are ready for the same during surgeries. Same way, those who, who are having Ken have a greater decline in heart rate and blood pressure during induction of anesthesia. And so the anesthetist has to be ready at the time of. Those who are having Ken have a higher incidence of stroke. And now I'll give a couple of minutes to this. This is very important. Ken and hypertension. Remember, a couple of studies have come out which shows, you can see here, that, and you can also understand, that initially in cardiac autonomic neuropathy, there is parasympathetic disruption, so there is sympathetic overactivity. In a normal person, what happens is, at night, parasympathetic overactivity is there, sympathetic system goes down, and therefore there is fall in blood pressure. You always expect a dipping in blood pressure during night. In cases of uh, cardiac autonomic neuropathy, there is a reverse thing, the dipping disappears. If you measure blood pressure at night, patient has either supine hypertension or at night blood pressure dipping, the fall in blood pressure disappears or in fact there is a rise in blood pressure, which means that patients with CAN, even though they are having normal blood pressure during day, they must undergo ambulatory blood pressure monitoring to determine whether they are having supine hypertension, which may be the cause of LVH in absence of daytime hypertension. It would also allow you to adjust the doses of drugs, especially at bedtime. You need to increase the doses at bedtime and you need to cut down the doses during day. This is very important. Same way, these patients have a very tricky situation. When they have got a supine hypertension, which is normal in sitting and lower in on standing. This is generally seen at a late stage and the drug of choice to your surprise would be clonid in here, a centrally acting drug which takes uh, the care of these things. What to treat? Supine or standing, diastolic or systolic, daytime or nighttime. That is always a confusion when you are dealing with cardiac autonomic neuropathy. And therefore, measuring blood pressure in all three positions may avoid fall and fracture. This is very important. If you think that the patient had cardiac autonomic neuropathy on your examination, on every visit you must measure blood pressure in three sitting, in three positions. Otherwise, the patient may fall down and uh, may lead to fractures. And there would be a lot of attack with vitamin D and calcium for nothing. Although, always think about the drugs that produce postural fall. Can is seen even in non-albuminuric patient and has been associated with CKD. One can also see that Ken is associated with wide pulse pressure. So every time you see wide pulse pressure, always think about Ken. Ken is associated with CKD and Ken is considered to be one of the cause for CKD. Because during diabetic autonomic neuropathy, there is decrease in erythropoietin which produces anemia and ultimately it may precipitate uh, CKD. So it is now believed that if a patient of Ken is there or diabetic autonomic neuropathy is there, always keep an additional or a more vigorous eye on microalbuminuria because it is more likely to develop CKD. There are other newer papers which suggest there is association of Ken with glycemic variability, there is Ken with uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Ken has recently been associated with adipocyte, which explains its association with uh, uh, obesity. This is a typical case. I'll, there are only six slides now. There is, this is a typical case. A 26-year-old woman with brittle type 1 diabetes experienced sudden cardiac death. Why this happened? She had a 16 years history of poor diabetes control, presenting with white blood glucose fluctuations, recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia unawareness. Persistent orthostatic hypotension with daily falls in systolic blood pressure ranging from 30 to 60 millimeter. Significant impact on her daily activities, although she was treated with midodrine. She had severe gastroparesis, refractory diarrhea, and painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy. She had resting tachycardia, which is considered to be a hallmark of cardiac autonomic neuropathy, with a fixed rate of 115, and all tests were positive. even c 8.7, create 1.9. So this is a typical case, which could have been prevented 16 years back, if the person would have looked for Ken. Last four slides about diabetic autonomic neuropathy. How we can continue because we don't have the second speaker yet. So you can take a few more minutes. No problem. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So I'll be a little slower. So uh, important thing is uh, clinical implication of diabetic autonomic neuropathy. So peripheral autonomic dysfunction is one of the presentation of diabetic autonomic neuropathy. And look, how does it present? 
There are changes in the texture of skin, itching, edema, venous prominence, callus formation, loss of nails, sweating abnormalities. And we all think this is diabetic neuropathy. This is actually diabetic autonomic neuropathy. How do you know? These are the same symptoms that you see when a patient has been sympathectomized. Previously, sympathetic chain removal was done or sympathetic ganglion were ablated and the same reaction was seen in the lower limb. So these are actually the signs of autonomic failure, peripheral autonomic failure. And these are the patients who must undergo immediately cardiac autonomic neuropathy detection. If it is positive, that means these are the signs of autonomic neuropathy rather than peripheral neuropathy. This would be the patients where you would not go on incrementing the doses of gabapentin or whatnot. Rather, you would try to control cardiac autonomic neuropathy with beta blocker or with AC inhibitors. This also contributes to diabetic foot and it can be detected very easily. Do you know how it can be detected? There are plaster neuropath that are available. What do they do? They change their color when they get exposed to water, salty water. So you have to apply it on the foot and when they would expo get exposed to the uh, uh, perspiration, they would change to orange color. Now those areas which would not have perspiration, they would remain of the same color that would be white. And you will be able to easily detect that these patients do not have perspiration at a particular area, which is a very, very typical sign of peripheral autonomic failure. Gastrointestinal autonomic neuropathy. Many people believe that gastropathy is uncommon. It is very common. And once people see gastropathy or suspect gastropathy, they immediately start the, the uh, peristaltic inducing agent or motility inducing agents. Remember the best documented agent that is important or that works the best or which is having highest number of trials is metoclopramide, nothing else. 10 mg of metoclopramide 8 hourly is useful. But what is the clinical implication of gastropathy? The clinical implication is very simple. The second case that I showed, patient was given 100 grams of uh, carbohydrate and still his blood sugar did not improve after one hour. Because the patient had gastropathy, the, there was no proper absorption of the food. The food remained inside the stomach for more than three hours, three and a half hours. And these are the cases which would not improve immediately on giving starch or carbohydrates. You have to give sublingual glucose. So gastropathy can prevent hypoglycemia responsiveness. Same way or the reverse way, gastropathy can occasionally produce hyperglycemia. How do they produce? You have given insulin 30 minutes before lunch as you always give. Patient has developed gastropathy. The food has not reached the intestine, does not get absorbed. And then there would be hyperglycemia. Food, when food reaches, insulin is not there. When insulin reaches, food is not there. So it produces hypoglycemia followed by hyperglycemia. So gastropathy is very, very important. In cases of gastropathy, the AGI stop working or they work little less than what you anticipate. Another important thing is diabetic diarrhea. Most of the people believe that diabetic diarrhea uh, occurs any time of the day. Diabetic diarrhea are watery non rather painless diarrhea occurring at night the treatment of choice once again you will be surprised to know is metoclopramide 10 mg 8 hourly lots of trials have come out that in diabetic diarrhea it works wonders now in additionally you can use lopramide you can use codeine which works very well in addition to erythromycin and tetracycline although now erythromycin and tetracycline are not recommended if you want to give you can give four days every month but not for a long time genitourinary autonomic dysfunction once again you all know bladder dysfunction and erectile dysfunction which is out of the scope of this lecture however one must remember erectile dysfunction is basically now a sign of independent cardiovascular dysfunction and uh, cardiovascular risk factor. So a patient of erectile dysfunction coming to you, first thing that you need to do is to send him for treadmill, look for cardiovascular risk factor, treat them and then treat his erectile dysfunction. Other implications, these are two important implications. Difficulty in night driving, patient coming to you, difficulty in night driving. You go on searching everything, glaucoma, retina, refractory error, vitamin E, what not. But actually the patient has autonomic neuropathy and there is failure of pupils to adapt. Just keep, have a look with a light at the pupil and you will immediately realize that his pupils are not properly responding to the changes in the light. 
So this is another implication. Same way, there are people who come back, come to you with cheese intolerance. As soon as I eat cheese, there are problems. Actually, these are the people who are having distal anhydrosis that we uh, said just before a few slides with central hyperhidrosis. No sooner they start eating cheese, there is profuse perspiration with severe salivation and that causes lots of trouble in swallowing the cheese. So these are the clinical implications. We go back to our case. 42 years old male having diabetes that Kindly I told conclude. you. Huh? Kindly conclude now. Huh. La last two slides. So this, this is the place where if you go for cardiac autonomic neuropathy in a patient having erectile dysfunction, you will be immediately able to differentiate. If it is autonomic in nature, you don't need to send him to a psychiatrist or go for very fancy test. And this is what I already told you. So concluding diabetic autonomic neuropathy is classified as subclinical or clinical. Serious dreaded chronic complication of diabetes associated with poor prognosis and poor quality of life. It can precede peripheral neuropathy. There's a central role of hyper, hyperglycemia and intensive glycemic control can prevent it. It is always better to prevent them. If we don't uh, update ourselves, we are always going to be in trouble. Even cats update themselves. So, next time when somebody presents a presentation on cardiac autonomic neuropathy, at least this question should not be there. Why don't we screen for cardiac autonomic neuropathy in diabetes? So it is time to check every diabetic for non-dipping, calcium scoring for all diabetics, white pulse pressure must be looked for, measuring BP in sitting, standing, in diabetic food patients, checking for peripheral autonomic dysfunction, and CAD screening in patients having ED. Once again, thank you everybody. Thanks Diabetes India team.